Hello! Hi there. <clears throat> Welcome to Microbiology Twitter. Uh, sorry, Microbiology Journal Club, where we know out big about all things small. My name is Danny. In a previous life, I dropped out from my PhD in microbiology at the University of Chicago, where I was infecting skin I grew with MRSA. But nowadays, I'm a fact checker for pharma school advertisers and the president of Biotech Without Borders, a nonprofit based in NYC, and dedicated to enabling the public with the tools of biotech. My name is Faz, and in a previous life, I got my PhD in microbiology from Imperial College London, where, amongst other things, I was making flesh eating bacteria glow in the dark. But I've also, since then, worked as a research integrity specialist, and these days, as an editor for an academic journal. Every week we meet to talk about microbiology, and today it's our deep dive week, where we look uh, in depth into figure, uh, each figure in a paper that we chose last week, and uh, to learn and criticize the scientific findings. Uh, this is a journal club, and we encourage our audience to leave us questions and comments. And next week will be our news week, where we survey a bunch of art different articles and choose one for the next deep dive, so make sure to subscribe to satisfy your microbiology curiosities. You can follow along with the papers that we discuss on either week in our shared Zotero library, linked in the doobly-doo below. And we want to hear from you, so please use the comments or even tweet at us using the hashtag microTWJC hashtag. Uh, so this week uh, we got How to Train Your Bacteriophage, which is the uh, clickbait title for the article. Um, yep. Uh, uh, I've lost the paper The now. T title of the paper is co Co-evolutionary phage training, training leads to greater bacterial suppression and delays the evolution of phage resistance. And boy, what a show we have we got for today. We've got we're looking at an evolutionary arms race between bacteria and viruses, and we find out that facts that may provide hope against the the rising antibiotic resistance. Yeah, absolutely. It's like harnessing the power of evolution for our own purposes because it's going on in the background and um yeah sometimes it's a problem i guess <laughs> like i mean it's the evolution of antibacterial resistance or uh, antibiotic resistance but uh at the same time like if we understand it better we can also use it for our own purposes <clears throat> yeah that's right um so yeah i've just put, put the slides up so yeah we've got our clickbait title how to train your bacterial bacteriophage and i guess the main thing we're look, talking about is co-evolutionary fa phage training um so th mm -hmm. this is an interesting paper that we're looking at because it's a pre. So the one we're looking at is a preprint. So in the doobly doo, we've got the links to the fully published paper and the preprint. But the fully published paper is behind a paywall, so we're going to be focusing most of our talking about the preprint because that's something that you, the audience, can actually access. Um, yeah, uh, and for the most part, it looked pretty similar. We got our hands on a copy of the PNAS paper, and like the text is very similar, maybe a little bit near the end. And you'll see in the slides, um, there's like a unique figure. They sort of, I guess, the reviewers of PNAS they asked for another experiment at the very end. <clears throat> right. Yeah, and this paper has thrown up a lot of threads. So I guess we can just start by talking. What is a bacteriophage? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Uh, so bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria. Uh, so, I mean, everything under the sun, I think, has a virus that infects it that's alive. Um, and when we think of a bacteriophage, it usually takes this form uh, of like a... Uh, <laughs> to me, it looks like a, the injectors from Steven Universe. I don't know if anyone watches that cartoon. But those were <laughs> yeah. based on it. So, so many things, I think, are based on this image of a bacteriophage because it's very otherworldly but in fact um they're everywhere <laughs> if you if you look uh they have a head that holds uh the dna or uh, yeah in this case we're talking about dna genomes yeah uh, there's like a tail that uh serves for injecting that uh genome into the cell and then usually tail fibers um that help um uh, recognize like the bacteria that it's going to attach to uh, so that, that the tail can do the injection <clears throat> yeah and so the and it has like a an interesting life cycle where uh so it can either go straight to popping like going inside using its dna genome to replicate inside the host to create more viruses or it can go dormant where it, it actually integrates within the virus with sorry within the bacterial genome in this phage mm -hmm. called lysoge lysogeny uh where they repressed all the thing so it stops the viruses from killing the bacteria this stays there dormant until something happens to shock the bacteria and then the viruses replicate but since the bacteria replicated a lot since then. There's a lot more viruses out there. Yeah. Um, I, I guess we should remind or we should tell people that we're talking about specifically phage lambda in this mm. case. Uh, it's like one of the most well studied phages. Uh, it affects E. coli. Uh, but just like how there's 
um, many different viruses. They all have very specific hosts in the world. This is the same for bacteriophages. There's all sorts of bacteriophages that, mm. that uh, infect all sorts of different hosts. But uh, we'll be talking mostly about Lambda and E. coli uh, during the course of this paper. Right. Uh, and yeah, the idea of using this, because this phage is a natural predator of bacteria, right? Um, mm -hmm. So naturally, for the idea of using them to kill bacteria has been around for a while. So I think you yeah. dug up a really brilliant quote from this uh D Darrell in 1922? Yeah, if people look at like the history of phage, there's usually two people associated for, with the beginning of uh, the study of phage. It's this Felix de Harel and um, something Twort, Francis Twort, I think like that. Mm. Um, and and what, they, what they found out was if they filtered using a really, really fine filter where no cells could possibly pass through the filter, they took the filtrate of certain cultures and then they added that filtrate into uh, the cultures of growing bacteria, all those bacteria would, would die. Um, and so they didn't really know what was going on. They knew mm. it was like some sort of very tiny particle that was doing this work. Um, and yeah, and they thought it was, uh, they thought it might be a really great thing to kill bacteria. And in fact, at the very beginning, they use it against things like cholera um, and salmonella. I think salmonella in chickens mm. was one of the early uh, things that was treated with this phage therapy. Um, and yeah, I thought this was, you know, this is just like old school science, 1922, uh, Felix yeah. injects himself <laughs> subcutaneously with some of this, essentially, it's just media that they grew the bacteria, yeah. right? That like, they found all the bacteria died. Um, and upon finding that there was no, um, adverse effects, they, he injected into his family as well yeah. and, uh, found out that you could get the phage, you could eat it, you can also drink it is what he figured out you can drink it or you can inject it and you get the phage uh, in your stool afterwards so it was able to somehow get into your bloodstream or yeah or into your gut um, and they were in this particular example i think they were trying to uh, get rid of like dysentery right anti-shiga right. shiga yeah. toxin is an e coli toxin that causes dysentery <clears throat> yeah and so I mean, we've, the people been working on phage therapy for like oh well, i guess over 100 years then technically well nearly yeah, a, yeah. so exactly it's but there was a lull in the middle um mm. because antibiotics came mm. <laughs> and they were i guess there was difficulty in um preparing uh reproducible phage titers because they were as you, as i as i said at the beginning like it's kind of they were just throwing things against the wall like they had cultures that spontaneously died they were able to filter those cultures and then use those cultures to kill other cultures um it wasn't quite known exactly what those objects were and it was hard to standardize um and antibiotics ended up being like really really yeah. effective in the ussr though people still or there were there was like a phage research group mm. um and it's it's still it's the group that's still around today yeah that's uh creating products that uh you can treat uh, certain diseases with bacteriophage. Um, if you like search the web, there's a whole bunch of articles being like, uh, they thought this was an incurable <laughs> antibiotic resistant infection. Then I traveled to Russia and got this, got this treatment. Um, so that there's been a renewed interest, especially because of antibiotic resistance mm -hmm. in this particular treatment. And this table, it's from a 2020 review, uh, Courtright. It has, um, I think, like 2017. There's like five case studies from 2017 to 2018, and then even some clinical trials. I think 2000, 2000 to 2018. So there's some renewed interest now. So there's a bit of a lull, I guess we would say, in the 70s. Um, certainly during the Cold War, mm. you know, USSR did their science, America did its own science. Um, uh, but it's it's a bit back. It's back now. There's a more excitement around it, and you know we have so many tools to sort of figure out what's going on with these therapies so uh there's a lot of promise <laughs> yeah i mean i remember like reading papers about about researchers actually complaining oh no this is all written in russian how will we ever find out what these what people did i'm like just ask someone to translate it <laughs> i mean but yeah but yeah. but i think that's a really i mean that's a really interesting point about science right like the the lingua frank franca is english and yeah. you know for english speakers that's amazing but um, you know, science does get done in other languages as well. Yeah. And especially during the Cold War, like, you know, they didn't have an English audience to write that science. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I feel like there was like a lot of uh, kind of disrespect for, for the science. I mean, partly because I think there was a concern about 
when they were translated, like whether the controls were done. And, and I think the main concern about phages is what, the difference between phages and antibiotics. An antibiotic, once you give the chemical, that chemical is pretty much going to be the same throughout the body, wherever you give it. Whereas phages, mm -hmm. they're, they're living creatures that evolve and change. Yes. So the phage you might get at the end of it might not be the phage you put in at the beginning, which is uh, a quite which harms the ability to reproduce. It's not because like mm -hmm. the science was done any worse. It's because the phage in itself is a such a complex organ, uh, complex living cr uh, thing that that you yeah. need to be a bit more kind of there's there's a lot you need to do in phages that you wouldn't have to do with antibiotics. And I think to think about, but to think about a modern context is biologics are like a really popular class of drugs now, right? Yeah. Which are antibodies. Antibodies which are made by cell culture. <laughs> and so um, I think it's, but back then they didn't have that technology. Right. So so I think that we've come this, we've come a long way in terms of being able to standardize and control the products of biological processes. And that that is also a reason why phage therapy um, might seem more tractable than it did in the past yeah uh, because we have some of these experiences from um other changing systems and and making them on mass yeah i mean the fact that we've got we can sequence genomes much more quickly and cheaply has mm -hmm. changed has changed the way that we can think about how we apply these and actually monitor and study these uh these uh viruses uh so i think mm -hmm. like we'll on go into the next uh, bit because uh we're talking a bit about how phages work because they work very much by binding to receptors almost like you mentioned with antibodies they have a specific lock and key thing uh, so so mm -hmm. do you do phages um yeah i mean this these are viruses right like we, yeah. we've come from talking about sars cov2 and the ace2 receptor this is this is no different <laughs> exactly the virus needs to find where it wants to go and in this case they want to find very specific species of bacteria um and that's often through some sort of like surface receptor mm. um and, but of course, like bacteria don't want to be infected by phage. Um, and so they might have adaptations, they may evolve adaptations to block that receptor binding, whether that's like, um, like some shielding molecule or like just changing the molecule slightly. Uh, and you can imagine though that you can't go too, too far in that direction, right? Like mm. if the receptor that the phage is using is critical somewhat for the bacteria, then the bacteria only has like a limited space it can maneuver uh, its evolutionary path. Uh, in order to uh, evade that recognition. Yeah, I mean, bacteria have got all sorts because yeah, bacteria have all sorts of really intriguing ways to fight off phages. I mean, one of the most important ones that that we have talked about on the show before is CRISPR. CRISPR was originally mm -hmm. isolated from bacteria, and its original function in the bacteria was to chop up to the genomes of invading phages. Um, mm -hmm. And we've taken mm -hmm. that, and now you're using it to modify and change genomes uh, using that same system, and absolutely um there's also and before we knew about crispr at least from mm. the adaptive evolution or adaptive immunity side there were also other uh we can call them innate immune functions mm. i suppose of bacterial cells where there were um enzymes that digest up phage dna uh, and of course you know phage can also try to like evolve in some way to either mask their dna in some way or activate those particular enzymes um, but then the bacteria can also evolve <laughs> to try to evade that. Um, and, and the point really, I think that we're trying to get at with this slide is that, uh, there are all these different ways that you can prevent a phage infection, um, and ways that the, the bacteria can evolve, but then phage can also evolve on top of that, M meaning that, um, there's, uh, there's, this is actually, this is the process of coevolution, right? Yeah. One change here makes a change in another. Uh, but they're two different organisms, and they're trying to accomplish different goals. Yeah, this is essentially the arms race that we talked about in the bit, where the where where each each like kind of uh, fact. So the virus and the phage they almost like are bring out bigger guns, big like that kind of mm -hmm. that Bugs Bunny Daffy Duck sketch where they like bring out bigger guns until you got them the size of a planet. <laughs> that sort of yep. yeah, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, mutations are generally said to arise spontaneously due to just the action of natural selection. Uh, so, uh, spontaneous mutations yeah, can, yeah. Spontaneous mutations, they just happen. But what what makes a mutation take over, right? Or when we say, like, a mutation is spreading, right? Mm. I mean, this is, I think this is such a relevant thing, too, as we talk about variants, right? It, 
it, it usually means there's some sort of selection event there. There has to be a way in which that mutation is mm, conferring something that allows the organism to be more successful than organisms without that mutation. Um, and so you get this, you get this effect of um, alleles sweeping through the population, or, where at first there's only a few, but like through time, uh, that particular uh, genomic variant um, takes over. And so that's like the the example A is the incomplete then complete hard sweep. Mm. This is like a good way to think about it. You have a whole bunch of different genomes. Red has this like beneficial response. And so over time, right, you get an intermediate where you get more of that specific genome. And by the end, it's only that genome, right? And the blue um, dots could be representative of other mutations that happen that uh, co-assort, right, with the mutation that actually confers the benefit. Um, and so you can get different scenarios occur, right? Mm -hmm. Like a soft sweep, right, would mean a soft sweep with staying variation sort of means there's already diversity. That mutation arises di in different ways. Mm -hmm. And then when you end up getting purifying selection here, now you have two different genomes at play. But they still have that critical variance in them, mm -hmm. right, that was responsible for the change. Um, yeah, you can have uh, you can have different mutations that uh, produce the same effect. So, like right. red in this case is one type of mutation, yellow is another. <laughs> so, like it doesn't have to be the same mutation. Um, so, like I, I think I'm gonna use all SARS-CoV-2 <laughs> examples, right? Yeah. But, like that's saying that it's we get mutations in spike, right? They they affect spike. But in Spike, there's many different locations, and a mutation in one may have the same effect as a mutation in the other, right? I mean, we don't know, really. That requires, like, a lot of research to dive into the exact responses, but it's a possibility. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and then the other two examples down here are negative selection examples. So, like, that's, like, you can also have selection go the other way, where if you have a mutation that isn't beneficial, those mutations will disappear over time. <laughs> yeah, so... the. Yeah, this is interesting. So it acts in a bunch of different ways. So these are sort of like things we'll be looking out for when they, these when are studying evolution for looking at the spread of mutations. Like understanding yes. how these work is quite an important thing to have just rolling on the back of your yeah. mind. Yeah, it's not a. I guess the point that I want people to take away from this is that it's not as simple as mutation appears and then takes over. Right. right? There's many steps in between. Muta when you say a mutation appears, it could be many different mutations that have the same effect. Right. And, uh, and and because like uh, phenotypes are very complicated sort of things, if we're talking about infectiousness or something like that, that's a complicated phenotype. Many genes interact to produce that effect. Um, and so when we say a mutation takes over or like mutants are taking over, uh, it really matters. Mm -hmm. Right. Like the specificity and those dynamics are ultimately what will have to be understood. Uh, we don't like we understand them in this general way, but to understand the specifics of it is going to give us those predictions on whether or not like, yes, this could happen or there is a risk of, um, you know, uh, resistance evolving, something like that. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Um, and the thing about bacteria and phage is that they, they're both they both they can both evolve really fast. Um, yeah. So, yeah, <sighs> it is thought as, 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 as back. Of, sorry, my. Evolutionary arms race is how we think of it, mm -hmm. and and when people and actually like there's been qu quite a lot of work done these not just to look at the idea of phages as kind of treatments but also as to understand how evolution works at this micro mm -hmm. level to study what these using these as a model for like how like say genes can find new functions and other things. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Be because I think the key here is these single cell organisms they their life cycle is so short <laughs> and they're only one cell mm. so uh in a population of these cells when you have little mutations scattered throughout so in a human being we're so many cells right mm. if we have mutations scattered throughout our body there's mechanisms to correct those things and like make sure it doesn't get passed on but these are single-celled organisms they pass on them right like if that if that bacteria survives it will pass on its mutation that is the way that mutants pass through the population. And so, yeah, it's a, it happens a lot faster. The scale of um, evolution happens a lot faster. This data that I picked out is to, um, is, is really, uh, I guess, something that supports the idea of the evolutionary arms race. Mm. Um, what it's saying is that um, the more diversity in, in phage, so like those, that's the increase in colors here, like mm -hmm. from 
low, medium, and high, you get this is more diverse in the genomes of phage. You also find that the alleles that are being swept to fixation, so the the places in the genomes that are like taking over the population over and over again, that happens at a higher frequency. You get a whole you get more genes that get fixed um, and, and are changing from their ancestral form uh, when you have a high diversity of phages. And so that this is a support to say that, uh, it means the bacteria are under this incredible selection pressure that they need to change their genomes to match that diversity of phages. Right. Yeah. Um, so this, uh, again, we, this brings us to the coevolution. So this comes from a, another experiment that was done previously with the E. coli and the T7 phage. Um, mm -hmm. And well, I'm... it's very similar to the setup that we'll see in the coming paper, mm. where they mix the two phage together. They mix the the host, the E. coli, and the phage together, and they let them. Well, here they passage them, so they're actually like subsampling uh, from a culture and moving it to a new culture, mm. and they do that several times. And you can see the dynamics here, like phage. The phage is fluctuating, even the and uh, yeah, the phage is fluctuating, and the bacteria levels are fluctuating as well. Um, and in the table below, when you take phage that were uh, grown in one of these, like these are the three replicates, C1, C2, and C3, mm -hmm. and you take them and you, uh, you spot them onto colonies from the founders, so the, the ancestral strains, you find that, oh, they can kill these founder strains a lot better, right? Uh, and so that's just showing that, I, I, yeah, that shows this idea that when you have uh, phage isolated from uh, long co-evolution, it becomes more effective. As a, people you can think of it as a time travel almost, right. <laughs> right? It's like they're coming from the future where they there's already been the arm the arms race has already gone through. It's the Terminator, I guess. Yeah, right? exactly. Like, <laughs> it's bring helicopters the escalated. into the yeah. Renaissance. I mean, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. I'll, mm -hmm. So yeah, you've got like your co-evolved like bacteria in one corner, and then they test and the phages they they don't they kind of they don't cause the same sort of issues but you bring back them back to the founder suddenly you see all these red kind of patches of uh what which represent the the phages killing off the original yeah, founders yeah. so demonstrating and yeah something that we can say about this data is that the phages that they have at the end of their co-evolution experiment don't really kill the bacteria of, from their co-evolved experiment mm. so the bacteria have successfully become resistant to these phages um and so like that's in, that that's an interesting point right when we think about uh when we think about using this to treat infection <laughs> because the, it is possible to get a bacteria that is resistant to this phage mm. and so the question might be become can you kill the founder quickly enough or in a way that um, it'll never get to that resistant form right by bringing back this phage from the co-evolved experiment and i think that that's really where the authors of this paper are trying to step in and give us more insight uh, as to this, as to the details of that process. Yeah, and I guess they're referring to this co-evolving co co as training because they're essentially training this bacteria to become better at, sorry, sorry not the bacteria, training the phage to become better at killing yes. bacteria. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, and uh, it's quite interesting, this this paper, because uh, they did these co co, co Coevolution based on uh, essentially uh, this is an offshoot of one of the most longest running experiments in bacteriology. So uh, this mm. so they use this bacterial uh, sorry the bacterial strain is Royal Six O Six I think which is from Richard Lenski's mm -hmm. lab which has been culturing like uh, the same yes. uh, culturing almost the same culture of bacteria for the last like thirty years to try and understand how the E. coli evolves and as an offshoot of right that, that's the LTEE, -E, the long term evolution experiment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, Veritasium uh, just produced a video of it this week. So I put, put a link uh -huh. to that video uh, in the doobly doo, just in case people were curious about it. But it's. Yeah, it's a really great experiment. Yeah. I remember when I learned about it in grad school and just to hear that. And it's been going on for so long, like they have freezers and freezers of, of bacteria frozen from every step of the passage. <laughs> Yeah, and so uh, the actual this what this paper does is it takes uh, the phage uh, I think from a co-evolutionary experiment that was done in 2011. Uh, uh, so so there's a co-evolutionary mm -hmm. experiment done in 2011 where they did this uh, where they incubated with uh, E. coli 
and then they froze it because they freeze everything keep just keeping records of it and then 10 years later they've gone back to that same thing referring it to as uh lambda trn and then cult and then comparing it with its uh founder counterpart the lambda unt so basically untrained versus trained and then they're comparing them again this time around uh something in the first experiment they found that this this trn had evolved to attack attack not one but two receptors so the lambda phage attacks this the the lamb b receptor but <laughs> yeah which probably is probably named after itself <laughs> yeah uh which uh is like this kind of pore in the membrane that's like made of three kind of uh it has a very similar structure to another uh, receptor called ompef and there's like a mutation that happened that allowed the trn to attack both receptors mm -hmm. yeah so that would give it like uh it, it would increase the uh chance right that the phage will find its receptor and also increase the chance that if something happens to one of the receptors it would still be able to use it um so the train phage is it's already uh, expected that the trained phage is going to be better at infecting E. coli than the untrained version. <laughs> yeah, I think that now is, they're going to be looking at a bit more detail as to what is going on there and how the E. coli mm -hmm. are kind of responding back to it. Um, yeah, so what we're seeing in these two figures is uh, the bacterial titer in A and the phage titer in B of three replicates of either the untrained phage, which is in teal, mixed with E. coli, or the trained phage, which is in red, mixed with E. coli. And you can see on the bacteria side, in the untrained phage, those teal lines go right up to a maximum of some sort. Um, that's considered the probably the nutrient limiting condition. Yeah. The, the E. coli are growing all the way up, using all the sugar in their in their mixture um, and, and being sustained at that level. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I think ecologically we call it the carrying capacity, but basically they can't have any more bacteria in them. That's like the upper limit. And yeah. And so you at that point you think, well, maybe the phage isn't doing so well at that point because if, if the bacteria aren't being killed off, then the phage probably isn't kill, doing the killing. Whereas yeah, with but it seems like it's it, it's kind of right in B. Those are the court in the teal lines. They yeah. correspond then, and you can see. I mean, yeah, the phage certainly drop off, and in some instances they do fall under the limit of detection. But there's still space to have like a a predation sort of experiment here. It's just that predation is not the primary way um, that 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 E. coli population is being controlled. Mm. <laughs> right. <clears throat> And then they look at the t uh, train phage, which is in red, mm -hmm. and that looks like the E. coli population again. They the this time the E. coli population are dropping to to near zero, which yeah, uh, yeah. They, but they fluctuate and then they seem to pop back up again. So like by the by the later time points, they've come back. So this is presumably and and this was seen too in the 2019 studies mm -hmm. that. Um, there's like a, yes, maybe at first phage will um, reduce the population down, maybe even under the limit of detection, but you wait long enough and those few bacteria that survive, right, those survivors will replicate and eventually repopulate. Um, and so you get that dynamic of at the beginning it's low. Actually, I see like crazy fluctuations at the beginning yeah. is how I would characterize it. Yeah. And then later on, uh, like the rise, but even in the solid red line, I think that's you can still see how it's fluctuating as it as it rises. Well, I mean, these kind of remind me of those. Uh, I don't know if you ever studied Locke Volterra, like kind of predator prey dynamics, where you got like basically the yeah. predator takes a big dip, but then the prey takes a big big dip, and you're almost seeing that with the mm -hmm. phages, uh, where because the phages are actually at quite a low level, and part of that could be because the actual the potential population of E. coli are, are going to be quite low. Then that means that's so once they've killed a lot of E. coli, the, the remaining number of E. coli aren't, aren't going to be able to produce as much phage. So then the phage yeah. population will drop in kind of synchrony with the E. coli population. So Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's, I think that that is something that people talk about, right? Like I did say phages as predators. Yeah, you're right. right. Like, um, that, that's, that, that is what many people see in this type of data um, is that relationship. And uh, again, it's a really cool system then because it's all happening in little flasks. <laughs> like, yeah. This is like not going out into the woods and counting rabbits and wolves, right? This is just like in your home, well, well, in the lab in this case, in your lab, sampling from a flask, right? Putting things on plates and being like, wow, like these dynamics are at play. Like you're seeing 
um, yeah, you're seeing life unfold in front of you. This little com competition. Yeah, it's a nice little little monster to test e basic evolutionary questions about that kind of relationship. And mm -hmm. I think the thing that mm -hmm. they they're kind of focusing on is because I feel that they've accepted the idea that phages will eventually be, be uh, well, actually bacteria will eventually evolve resistances to phages. And so yeah. the question they're asking is, how long does that take? What what is what are the underlying principles that cause that delay to happen? Yes, and and if we understood those, does that mean where? How does that inform our um, ability to create phage therapy technologies to take advantage of what we know about those principles and you know make sure that uh, our therapeutics are effective from day one and not like allow more resistant bacteria to spring up? <laughs> yeah, I think we can then move on to the next uh, phase phase of the paper where they uh, mm -hmm. sample the big uh, bacteria at different times and then challenging them with the ancestral phage to look at the like how well they grow against it. So these are essentially like growth yes. curve traces. Um, the dot, yep. yeah. And the dotted line. Oh, no, yeah, no, go you, you go, you go. <laughs> I've talked too long. Oh, really? <laughs> the the dotted line is the control. That's the that's the bacteria that they isolated from one of those time points, uh, and they just let grow without the phage. Uh, and then the line with the color. That's where they either added in again teal, the untrained phage, or. Um, red the train phage and they see how uh how it kills or doesn't kill uh the bacteria that they've picked out yeah and this mostly gives us an idea of what partial resistance looks like so the so we know kind of like what a non-resistant would look like because non-resistant will be exactly the same as control fully fully like susceptible would look like a flat line but partial resistance you get these yep. small bumps of where there's a, some growth then it drops down to a slightly lower lower level or ends up slow, growing quite yeah. slow so I think what I found really fascinating about, so this is their go-to now resistance assay, mm. right? When they want to find out resistance, they're going to use this particular test to figure out uh, whether or not they have resistance in a, in a certain pairwise combination. Um, but what they pointed out in the paper is that typically, or also what I noticed, right, mm. is like typically when you think about doing these types of resistance assays, you do them by plating on media, mm. <laughs> but they didn't get very good results from plating. Um, and they suspect that that's because in their coevolution experiment, it's all happening in liquid culture. So there's some sort of disconnect between the phenotype of making um, making they make clearings uh, plaques on, yeah. on a on a lawn of bacteria. There's some disconnect between that environment and the liquid environment where you don't see the effects of the coevolution so much um, in that in that particular case because the coevolution was done in a really different environment. <laughs> Which I find really interesting, because I find like that some uh, of the bacteria that were resistant to phage become susceptible once they do it in solid media. Which is really mm -hmm. interesting, and again, yeah, what, another of those qu questions we could go down a rabbit hole and really look at what's happening and what that means. Right. But, uh, th th that's it's really not the... the focus of this paper. Yeah. yeah, it's not the focus of this paper. Um, the other thing that I think I want to point out about this figure is this is a good time to see their naming uh, conventions yes. on all the different uh, bacteria. So they have the ancestral strain, which is rel 606-S. Yes. So dash S meaning susceptible. sensitive. Yeah, sensitive, yeah. Oh, susceptible. I say yeah, susceptible. susceptible, you say sensitive. Potato, potato. <laughs> <laughs> Except they're two different words, but they mean the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then P meaning partial resistance, mm -hmm. the dash P at the end, and then they have dash R meaning resistant. So they've made the judgment call when they when they name these strains um, whether or not they're uh, partial or resistant already. And then uh, P1 or P2 or P3, that's the replicates of right. the experiments, right? They've, do they've done it three times, so there's three P numbers for each color. There's P1, P2, P3 for teal, P1, P2, P3 for red. And then T, that's time. Hmm. So T20 means 20 days. That's 20 days into the coevolution experiment. Um, and so already, I think think from this you can sort oh no it's hard to see we'll probably see it in later ones i was going to try to see some like patterns that emerge as time goes yeah by. it's difficult because um, uh, again t t the, it's not necessarily in cr chronological order uh <laughs> yeah so they just gave us a smattering of examples here. yeah <laughs> but we can see that a lot better in the next figure which is figure two where mm -hmm. we can see the chron how resistance uh t over overwhelms the populations as time can go go on um yes 
So they just did those graphs that we just saw. They did a whole bunch of them for each of these time points. Mm. <laughs> Uh, and then they colored the bar in based on the proportion that come back, right? Either completely resistant, partially resistant, or sensitive. Right. So uh, the first like three A, B, C, they're all for the uh, original uh, version of the phase resistance, uh, lambda un untrained. Untrained. Um, mm -hmm. And what you see is that resistance evolves pretty much. It tends to dominate within like uh, ten days at first. Uh, yep. And there are some fluctuations after that. I mean, there is some partial resistance seen a day after, but um, and then with the trained phage, you so you see that actually um, some one like culture like they remain all sensitive to, towards the end of the experiment. Another one partial, and the the last one was the only one where they seem to uh, achieve complete resistance. Yeah, but it took twenty days. It took twenty <laughs> days, so. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, and um, they will end up doing sequencing after this, and from that they did they had this observation that in the uh, trained or yeah sorry in the yeah in the untrained conditions that on days 17, 22, and 19 they can find the evidence that they're using that re the, that same receptor that the trained phage is using. The yes, RF. so mm -hmm. that, that so <laughs> that's one of those. Uh, so I guess if you have access to the PNAS paper, the PNAS paper, they uh, will they do show that that the resist the untrained let's say the trained resistance re-evolves, which is an interesting yes. finding. Um, mm -hmm. And to be expected as well, hmm. because if you think about the original way that they found that trained phage, it was through passaging bacteria with the phage for multiple passages. Essentially, that's what's happening here as well, right? It's a very similar type of experiment. The details are slightly different because just the timing and, and things like that, but it's the same idea. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that it was predictable. I mean, the because uh, for, for me, evolution, well, natural, this, the, the, the production mutations is a random process. So the idea that this mm. exact same thing can evolve a number of times is interesting and in itself is a interesting finding for the paper because again there's nothing stopping another wild mutation occurring so the fact that it's the same thing and that we could actually predict oh, what's happening sure. that's quite amazing yeah, to me. I, I agree yeah no, you're right because when we in the first instance that was just one evolutionary event that occurred right that swept through the population but who's to say that if you redid it over and over again, the same event would lead to the same, right, to the yeah. resistance? Yeah, we could definitely say that resistance is probably likely to occur again if you're doing this sort of uh, experiment. But yeah, I, I think that you're right to say um, that it this, that it's the exact same uh, <laughs> ability that got evolved is, is, is significant in some way. Yeah, I think that that's interesting because we think of evolution as a random process, but actually it... It, it relies on random processes, but isn't actually as random as people would think it is, because it is, because we could, because again, we wouldn't be, because people were able to predict I mean, this. It's, it's constrained. It's constrained by the the materiality of biology yes. in some ways, right? It's constrained by that selection. Um, we don't know, like <laughs> we couldn't tell you de novo. <laughs> I mean, I think that's the dream, mm -hmm. maybe, right? But we couldn't tell you de novo that it would happen this way. But you know, it would happen some way, right? Like life finds a yeah, way. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Top Jeff Goldblum co quote. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I guess that, I mean, is there anything else you want to say about that figure before we move on? Or no, yeah, yeah let's, let's move let's on to figure S2, where they take phages isolated on day 27, day 20 of co culture, and then they we use them to uh, to infect completely resistant isolates from two days before. Well, from before. Um, yes. <clears throat> yeah. In some ways, this is very akin to the experiment that we saw, like that was done in 2019. Hmm. Before this, right? They're just taking like the later ones and and bringing them back. Um, but it is interesting to see that like just a few days differ, <laughs> right? Like it's only a few days that that resistance appears. Um, to to these phage. Yeah, and then only a few days after that resist that previous resistance is no longer uh, resistant anymore. So that's fascinating. Yep. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, um, I guess that's. I mean, that's against. Yeah, I think that's all. That... Yeah, oh. that's all she she wrote, folks. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So mm -hmm. now the mut we're looking actually into the function of uh, resistance and the mutation rates uh, and how things evolve. So they do a Luria Delbrook, uh, uh, can't remember the 
the important fluctuation study. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's that was like one of the ways in which people um, or that people Lurie and Delbrook mm -hmm. um, set up this experiment to try to demonstrate that mutations happen before right the selection occurs. It's not that when the pressure the selection pressure appears do the mutations appear but rather the mutations are in the population already and then when you add the selection it gets it it sort of removes all the things that weren't able to to tough it out in in that scenario um and and that experimental design can also be used to estimate the number of mutants right that um or yeah the number of mutants that occur within a population a rate of mutation if you will right. uh for that specific selection pressure um and so that's thought of the the variable i guess so Lurie and delbrook they're like a famous um like biology physics duo mm. <laughs> where they tried to understand biology through uh writing equations um that like could generalize these these phenomena they were that they were seeing and so they have this equation here where from the proportion of um all the sensitive versus non-sensitive uh scenarios um you can you can you can discover the mutation rate for resistance if you also know just the number of cells that were going into that scenario um and so I guess we should probably explain the fluctuation test, right. at least the one that they're using to calculate. Uh, all it means is that they grow up their bacteria to a known amount. They have like one flask that has a whole bunch of bacteria. Yep. They split that bacteria into many different flasks. In this case, they use um, a 96 wall plate. <laughs> yeah. So they have 96 flasks, essentially. 96 conditions in which mutations could occur and then they run, then they split up those into their resistance tests. And they say, from, from all those, which ones gave rise to resistance? And so it's not gonna happen in every single condition, mm. right? Th these tests are done, these aren't co-evolution tests. These are just bacteria growing. Yeah. Um, and they're being checked after the fact to see, did res is there resistance in this population? And if you have enough independent cultures, you will see a certain number of cultures that have resistance in them. <laughs> yeah, I think the the thing that the, the is also looking at. So I think the original experiments were looking at genetic drift somewhat about how like even when when there's no selection pressure, the genetic like components of the population can change, especially if it goes through a bottleneck. Um, mm -hmm. So when you you select for them, then you select for individuals who have a variation, and then mutations can get fixed just because some some made it through the bottleneck and some didn't. So you'd end up in each of these flocks, you'd get a a snapshot for all the diversity in that original flask, right? And, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. that would give you an idea of, say, what mutations were were, were available to be used for for the for the bacteria to use in uh, the selection test. Yeah, that's I like I like your I like your example a lot. I think there's something very eloquent there to say um, it's a snapshot of all the mutations that were in that original flask, right? Like we've. By ice, by creating the artificial bottlenecks of splitting them off, we're we're saying something about just the original population. Right. <clears throat> it's like you're doing. Uh, I, I don't know if you heard about the Pitcairn Island story of like where uh, pe uh, mutineers from the HMS Bounty uh, went to Pitcairn Island and then uh, got inbred of the uh, generation. So you basically have this little petri dish of human population where you can see all the genes and trace them all back to the individuals that had them, but then isolate from oh, the rest of the population. Kind of. Like taking so from, you're saying from the population of this island, you know, like who were the mutineers on that ship? I think so. I think I'm again. Yeah. I'm not an expert. I am a microbiologist, so I'm not an expert on this particular <laughs> thing. But that is my interpretation of like because uh, you do see population bottlenecks throughout. Look, I mean, the most notorious one is just the inbreeding of the royal family, where where hundreds of people yes. had very rare blood diseases because of one mutation in Queen Victoria that spread to the royal families mm -hmm. across Europe because of that. Uh, because of the way um, that gene was spread uh, uh, and all the yes. intermarrying between her children and everything. So it's uh, so this is almost like a way to to examine that in in a microbial form of just taking out these individual bottlenecks, yeah. forcing these little bacteria to do the equivalent of inbreeding because they've got less genetic diversity than the original one and then <laughs> yep. and then placing that out. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, that's I, I that's a I think that's a good description. And so from that, they take those numbers and they run it through their equation to get that mutation rate to figure out how many in that original population, right, um, have the mutations required for uh, these the resistance to these two phage. And they find that uh, the mutation rate for the untrained phage is about six times ten, six times ten to the negative six. But the mutation rate for the trained phage is two times ten to the negative eight. So that's like a hundred times difference, approximately. Yeah. So uh, yeah, there's qu quite a big difference. So hmm, interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, this is this would be the this would be the statement. This would be the data that allows us to build the statement. And we also saw it earlier with like how resistance took a long time to appear, if at all, in the trained version, saying that there's a delay in the ability for these. Uh, for the bacteria to develop resistance to the train phage. <clears throat> so, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess that basically says that there are less options for ba for bacteria to evolve resistance to the train phage then in this situation compared to with yeah, the untrained. Yeah, I don't think, I don't think we know why, right? We don't know why there is this difference, just that there is, is one. <laughs> yeah, I think we can uh, make, I think the rest of the paper, we can make guesses though, uh, based on what they find from yep. the rest of the paper. So, can move mm -hmm. on to yeah. figure s3 where they delve in a bit deeper into the what mutations are actually happening what do they spot uh, occurring in these populations um so we've got this table slash graph which shows uh common mutations that, that appear across uh so across, on the kind of x-axis you've got all the different strains and then the mm -hmm. y-axis you've got the areas of mutations and then it shows you like when a mute so when a mutation appears in multiple strains you get these lines of blocks yes and then they colored them yellow based on if they get those lines of blocks they're like oh this must be an important resistance mutation uh that's how they make that judgment call but then also that um uh, they already know, right? We already have studied lambda infecting mm. E. coli for a while, so you also know like the important things that should go into that infection. So like you can see like op f is in there. Yep. Uh, you can see mal t, which is like a regulator of the lam b um, receptor. Those are both in there because we already know mm. <laughs> that those things uh, influence phage infection. Um, so yeah, this is the way to show it. What else do they do here? Oh, can we see? I just want to yeah. see what I wrote on. The Okay. Caption. Yeah. Um... Oh yeah. They also repeated their mutation assay mm. <laughs> a bunch of times. So there's like these orange, these orange things. Those are um, those are just repeats of the fluctuation test yeah. where they found resistance occur, and they pick the resistant uh, bacteria from the fluctuation test and and sequence them as well. well yeah. I mean, every time uh, they run that that fluctuation test or anything like that, they are selecting for more resistance. So. It's more data points yes. they can put in, and that can add to their overall story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, they point out that if you look at, so they have two partial resistant strains uh, in the orange column, and then in the last one they have a resistant strain. And they're saying that, I guess because it's JB42, or yeah, to JB47, something like that, that's through the acquisition of just one other additional mutation, giving it full resistance. Yeah. So already, already from this this uh, graph is like really nice to show us like how does the resistance happen? And you can already see it's not as easy as just one mutation in one place that keeps coming back and sweeping through the population. There are many different mutations that can make this happen. Right. <clears throat> and they do like talk a few a bit about some of the specific mutations they see. So I think the first one was like a. Uh, a 27 gene deletion that convert, conferred partial resistance that wasn't predicted by any other experiments they'd known before. So that, that could be quite yeah. interesting. Um, yeah, so already just by doing these evolution experiments and looking into it, like this is the concept of the long-term evolution hmm. experiment as well, right? By doing, by setting up the conditions where evolution can happen, then just sequencing back in your, in your library of what's going on, you can understand what what genes contribute to certain phenomena and in this case they're finding like uh this lpca gene that somehow uh, impacts lambda infection i think it it's a lipopolysaccharide uh synthesis something like this yeah that, that could make sense because uh, again that's very important for phage resistance because i think going back to that big slide you did earlier about how polysaccharides can shield uh protein somewhat occasionally from yeah phages uh yeah so it could be that it's somehow cloaking the 
the the receptor in some way because of the different shaped polysaccharide. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, and next one is uh, frame, sh frame shifting mutations in MOL-T, which is a regulator of LAMB. So LAMB is the thing that the phage grab grips onto. So if that's not being the created, receptor. then that's going to confer some resistance. Yeah, and here they see two gradations mm. where a frame shift mutation, which sort of blows out the protein 100%, that gives complete resistance. But you can have point mutations that maybe like damage the protein or like modify its function in some way. Those just confer partial resistance. And they also found uh, deletion of WA genes conferred resistance. <laughs> uh, and again, these are also important for phages that use LPS as a receptor. But it hasn't really been seen in Lambda until until now, I guess. Um, yeah, and I think they sort of use the two, the WA genes and the LPCA, to build this like little small hypothesis that they they can't they don't investigate again. It's just another rabbit hole to go down. But they say like, oh, like how does LPS um, affect like these particular phages that we know use LAMB and OMP F as a receptor? <laughs> yeah, and there's one other thing that caught my attention because there's this big deletion between ECB zero zero seven two six to ECB. 0739, which they didn't really comment about in this paper. So I did do a Google mm -hmm. search for it, though, and I did find that there was a paper that found an exact, the exact same mutation um, called sustained coevolution ah. of phage lambda in uh, e, e. coli involves inner as well as outer membrane defenses. So this was done from the lab of uh, Richard Lensky, and it's I think it's available in BioArchive, mm. and they were looking at what mutations might affect the inner membrane through some experience. I didn't look in too closely into it, but I just found it interesting that this has been spotted before. And so that, nice. yeah, another little like kind of line that this, this because I mean, the thing about this kind of research is that there is, it spawns off lots of other little lines of research that we can look into, and it's quite easy to get get excited about one little aspect of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, that's 2021 virus. Yeah. Right? So that's something that's, it may have come even just from, like, seeing this preprint out there and then, like, following up on it in a different way. Yeah, yeah I mean, th this one actually was, um, so this paper, they were doing selection experiments in a very similar way to this. And this, essentially, I found it from the supplementary material of the paper, uh, that came up on Google. Ah. So if I was reading the paper, I would have never known to, known about this. But I think <laughs> it came up in their list of mutations as well, so which is I found quite fascinating. Um, yeah, absolutely. I guess this is also this is um, an example of reproducibility yeah. right, in science. When people talk about reproducibility, it's important that people are working on similar problems in different angles because then you can see the same results that confirm that what you saw wasn't just a one-off <laughs> yeah and it's it's great when you've got like things like where you, or i can literally do a google search for ecb 00726 i can find all the papers that are related to it and then f try and figure out mm. what's and pick up something like that uh that's the great thing yep. about open science um yeah uh so moving on from that uh right figure s4 so this is a paper this is part of paper where they uh, to try and classify the growth trajectories. So I've kind of po posted mm -hmm. up these graphs uh, just to show that what, what they're doing here is essentially trying to kind of compress those graphs down into one single data point. So in PCA yep. does dimensional reduction. So it kind of put, puts those down and you can see that uh, the, the partially uh, resistant and m they all kind of cluster together depending on like how their growth trace looks. So... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted to I want to remind people that this is the same like these dimensional reduction techniques. We've been seeing these mm -hmm. right in the single cell at least. Yeah. And and, and and studies like that with RNA seq. Right. In those data sets, it's the same as this data set. You get you have one condition, right, one cell in those cases that have a huge list of different parameters, all the different genes and whether or not they're expressed or not. In this case, we have um, a list of all these different strains. Right. And a huge list of all the times and the um, the density of those bacteria at those different points. And so it's the same idea that you have this really big data set, but how do you make it so that there's just one number or a few numbers that can describe that data in relation to the others? And so that's what the dimensional reduction does in this case. Yeah, I mean, I re actually recall like struggling with this exact same problem during my thesis and trying to figure out how, how to turn these growth curves into a single data point that can compare between each other. And there's all sorts of things you can do mm -hmm. in like, say, there's a growth rate, there's a carrying capacity, there's... Uh, yep. I mean, in the end, in some cases, you can look at, so you can take one kind of aspect of it, or you could try and pu pull out, like, 
um, if you don't know the underlying model for what causes growth rate, you can say, okay, area under the curve analyses, but all these ha have different, like, kind of problems with them, and PCA kind of lets an algorithm decide it for, for us. So it's kind of unbiased in that mm -hmm. sort of respect. Um, so, I th so I think that what they, how they use PCA in this is quite quite interesting. It makes me think that wish that I could go back in time and redo my experiments with the uh, knowledge <laughs> of how PCA works. <laughs> yeah, it'd be, I'm actually kind of interested. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Like, you can do. Oh, I'm touching the microphone. Um, yeah, it's interesting to think like you could do this. Uh, yeah, with area of the curve, or like if you modeled the curve and then um, like took the slope or whatever, or some function course right that that corresponds with the with the slope, I guess, of the graph or something like that, the inflection point. I mean, yeah, I know that my my question would get well, the slope would get confused because with the partial there are two slopes that go in different directions. Uh, carrying right. capacity might mm -hmm. might work, but it's uh, again, it might not be able to differentiate between partial and the completely resistant very well. Area under the curve. Mm -hmm. It's great if your if your graphs all have the same kind of shape, but if there's also variation mm -hmm. in the shape, then there are certain areas. So because if you can have different uh, different shapes and have the same areas, so, you, so there is a lot of kind of willingness there as well. So I think that P yeah, and PCA yeah, that also has its. I mean, because again, you're leaving it up to an algorithm to figure it out. So there could be something there, but uh, it all depends on what you d decide is the best way. And I think that. This this way of trying to because I can kind of sense that they they see what's happening yeah. here and they want to find a way to mathematically kind of pin it down and that's quite difficult. In the in the text of the preprint, they say that they tried the OD trajectories mm. and the area under the growth curves and it didn't work as well as this <laughs> to separate everything out. So they tried and they found PCs. So this is very empirical, yeah. right? This is the this is like empirical data massaging yeah. where you're like, I know that there are differences between these things, but I need a number to show that to me. So they tried a bunch of different ways and then this is the one that stuck. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I guess I understand the, the reasoning behind that, but I also know that that can lead you down to some dangerous rabbit holes. If you if you, if you pick a, str a test that isn't stringent enough or is, is just suiting your specific data set, then it can mess you around over when you try to reproduce it. Yeah. Because then it's too stringent to that specific data set that generated it. Mm -hmm. um, so just something to keep in mind, right? I think that this is these yeah. are always good discussions, and when you when you think about tools, even uh, like so, even even uh, computational tools, right, have some mm. limitations inherent in them, some assumptions that are being made, um, and that's like a really important part of I guess dissecting um, some science. <laughs> yeah, for for sure. Um, yeah, so I think we've talked about this, and I think this is an important thing to, because they use this. Uh, they use PC one, so P, with PCA they they take the area of like the 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 area of most variability. So that's yeah. PC one, and the second most variability is PC two. So yes. obviously, I guess the, the main variability they're looking at is whether the bacteria are there or not, because that's going to be have the most diversity. You either have lots or not, and then it purifies that down into the idea of okay, we're going to use this as a proxy for whether there's resistance or partial resistance or sensitivity yeah absolutely <clears throat> so uh yeah figure three it, so uh this is an interesting one so um well they take their pc one now yeah like they have a number <laughs> they have a number that describes uh the growth profile and then they correlate that against how many mutations appeared so like from the big chart graph where they had all the yellow highlights and uh, they do linear regressions uh, yeah, they do. A, yeah, they do a linear regression. I'm <clears throat> kind of a bit. I mean, I'm a bit iffy about the linear regression in A because you basically got your x-axis <laughs> is so your y-axis is uh, non-categorical data, and your x-axis is categorical data that's either one or zero. So you're always uh -huh. gonna get uh, a good a good regression on it. I think you, there you got yeah. high, especially you have only like a few points. So it's. So that's but they're not, not really. Be... I, I don't think they're taking that much from it. I mean, like in some no. ways, it's just this is. <laughs> they could have just stated that <laughs> that there's growth when there's one mutation and there isn't when there's zero. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They yeah. they actually didn't need to have go as far as to give us an R squared value. We we can kind of see that. Oh yeah, there's definitely yeah. 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 Um, but, but it's a bit yeah. more useful in the in the instance where there's like a lot of different mutations that could be occurring. Um, because then it gives us that sense that more mutations uh, correlates with more um, PC1. 
Yeah, I mean, reasons. this is, again, because I'm not sure whether, like, what are we talking about when we talk about mutation? Are we talking about, say, how many genes that are affected? Or because we had one big deletion that affected a whole gene. Yes. Are we talking about point mutations? So how are we defining the mutations here? Um, yeah. Because uh, some mutations, if you're looking at just, like, the change of the genome, some mutations will have lots and lots of effects. And so that would, like, throw off your, your graph quite a lot. And some of them might not. So I feel like um, there... It, um, I, yeah, no, uh, I, I agree. Like, yeah, the and it's because that the resistance mutations that they're they're classifying is largely by their own mechanism, right? Like in a table, there's not yeah. like, um, yeah, they haven't. It's not totally quantitative. There's like a pseudo quantitative like feel to that. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, there's a lot of so yeah. I mean, I feel it like through, it went through coding. It's like um, right? It's like a psychology experiments, right? Mm. Where they code. They code some sort of scale <laughs> in some ways like that's what we're seeing with putative resistance mutations it's already passed through this like filter that brought its own um its own thought process bias to it <laughs> yeah i i feel like saying that just five mutate and again the me are they focusing on just mutations that affected uh so when they, they were, when they were looking at their their like kind of because there must have been lots and lots of mutations that might i mean what's the background mutation rate we're looking at here i mm -hmm. mean what are we so, I mean, they're looking at putative resistance mutations. So these are mutations they've already decided are related to resistance. Yes. So, yeah, so I already, just from that, from knowing how they chose their mutations, there is something that just sprung to mind that they could miss, right? What if there are mutations that are important for resistance, but they only occur, they only occurred like once in their set, right? Mm -hmm. So then they didn't, then they couldn't pick them out because they didn't come in multiple strains. Um, and then they're not already known to cause resistance. So they just slip through the cracks right those mutations wouldn't be registered in their list <clears throat> yeah so uh, this this kind of i was i'm lukewarm on this figure i, I like <laughs> i like the use of P pc pca but i'm not quite sure about how it's being used in this instance but i think it'll, yeah uh but but i think, I think but but i think from the extreme i think what you can take away from the extremes though is 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 pretty good that like when you have a bunch of mute, right, with the five, because uh, you can just see it from the resistance versus partial. I think to me, that's the, that's all that I'm getting from this is that yeah. like, the two resistant strains have five <laughs> and then all the partial ones have less. <laughs> yeah. I, and then I, same in the one it, for uh, the, the untrained phage, the resistance strain has one, the sensitive has zero. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like with this, with this, uh, it, it seems like a representation of like qualitative data, and I'm not going to be able to like predict, say that oh, if it has six mutations, it's going to be, it's going to be all the way up to one with uh, phage resistance, or it's going. Yeah. So you. And similarly, I think that you couldn't say that there isn't something that exists that has just one or two mutations that could be fully resistant, right? We just right. don't. Maybe we don't have the right outlier, right? Like we haven't done enough replicates to like see that thing appear. Yeah, I feel like this kind of the, the the lens they're using to analyze their data with this data analysis isn't necessarily the best one. But then again, but I can't really I can't really tell you what a better one would be at the moment, apart from just listing each strain and saying this is what it, what it does and listing the whole yeah, spectrum. Just, and, just the yeah. table, <laughs> just the table with the highlighted thing. Yeah, this is just the more mathematical way to go at it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it produces significance, and reviewers love significance, right? Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, apart from that, the, this figure four is quite interesting, because this is a competition essay where they look at, at the original sensitive strain and competed it with the coval strains to see whether the coval strains were better or worse at mm -hmm. just general fitness. And this is quite an interesting one, because um, the... Yeah, they... Oh, go ahead. No, no, you, you go ahead. I've talk quite a lot oh yeah no i was just gonna say and they do see that in the in the train phage um conditions the e coli um that come out from there that are partially resistant or fully resistant the p and the r's they have a lot less they don't grow as well when yeah. you stack them up against the um the sensitive version <clears throat> Yeah, I think this is a really clear way of showing that. So essentially, like mm -hmm. one in here, the dotted line is if there's like no di difference in the growth between the resistant and non-resistant strains. So we're seeing that with the untrained mm -hmm. phage, when the when the bacteria evolve a resistance to it, 
that is actually a relatively easy cho choice for them because the bacteria don't seem to be affected very much competition. With mm -hmm. uh, the un with the trained phage, however, where they they basically have to alter two uh, surface genes in order surface proteins in order to evade it. Suddenly, we're seeing that the the bacteria do have a cost. Yeah, absolutely. So that's good. I, I think that this, this is a nice little nugget of info, <laughs> right? Yeah. That um, and and again, this is part of. We're tr they're trying to explain the delay, right, in mutation. Why is it so difficult to get mutations to occur or to get resistance to occur to the un to the trained phages? And uh, this is one of the potential mechanisms that they can now cite, right? That oh well, when you get those mutations, those bacteria grow slower, so they're slower to appear. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, and now we're going to figure S5, where the coval phage were compared to the ancestral phages in their ability to suppress resistant bacterial growth. Um, mm -hmm. So this is looking at the untrained phage specifically. Yes. Yeah, so first they looked at the untrained phage. This is the ancestral versus the final evolved. Mm -hmm. And then they're being tested against three different resistant strains. Um, and no effect, it seems. <laughs> yeah, no no effect. I mean, yeah, I, I can try to pick out an effect, but I just... Doesn't yeah. seem to be very this, clear at all. To me, this makes a lot of sense because there's only one mutation that, or like that one mutation confers resistance. Mm. Um, I just think that, well, I, I guess we don't know on the phage side what's happened, but um, it's if it's only, to me, if there's only one thing that needs to change to allow you to evade, I can't imagine there's that much space for the untrained phage to have differences um, that would give it a, that much better of ability. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah um hmm. so going to figure five now this this is actually the, a similar experiment they do but with the train phage yeah where where instead whether we do actually see kind of a difference right mm -hmm. no we yeah yeah we, um, we do see a difference here that like the trained phages so the, the phages from the future <laughs> right against um uh, yeah, the phages from the future against the resistant strain, they do better than the phages from the past against the resistant strain. So future here is purple, and the past, the ancestral, is um, orange, teal? I'm not sure what that color is. Uh, sorry, not teal, orange or red. Um, orange, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, but they, I, do, they do do better. So here, so this is, this is actually really interesting, right? Because in both these cases, they made the judgment call that these bacteria are resistant, but uh, I guess there's still gradation in that. <laughs> there's still gradation in resistance um, to be able to see the, the separation that uh, uh, the bacteria are even more resistant to the original phage than the later ones. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so, uh, so I think what they did is they created a TRN+, plus, which is uh, essentially the, the TRN at the end of the experiment, and they tested that up against the... Yeah. I don't think they right. created it. I think this is just, it's not, it, I mean, it is created, right? Through doing the co-evolution, they yeah. grab the phages from that time point. So, <clears throat> yeah, TRN, so this is taken at T, T25. Uh, well, so, yes. so, and then they, so again, this is echoing that paper we saw, like, in the, the first, like, few slides, where they take mm -hmm. a, a, a phage from much later that has kind of evolved, it's, it's further up in the arms race, and they send it against the original bacteria, and they compare it against the original phage and they find that um so they they take this phage traces and again they take that pc1 uh measurement to, mm -hmm. to quantify what how well the traces compare against each other and how well the bacteria are basically doing in their growth and they find that actually yeah the the more the better armed late stage trn phage is better at killing uh, suppressing the these uh bacteria yeah so I mean, th I find this strange because it's not I, like, does it mean that these these phages have other efficiencies in them that allow them to do this? And for some reason, those efficiencies, they aren't they they can't be found in the untrained version. <laughs> like, why? I, I, I actually am very to me, this is the most surprising um, result is the comparison between the future, the yeah, the version of trained in the in the untrained form that uh, later phages don't seem to gain any efficiency on on infecting but here they do gain some efficiency why is that uh, and again i think it has to do with something that 
it's something about like that single mutation versus the five mutation in the resistance. It's like the population of bacteria are, are, are like so different in this form, but they're using bacteria. Yeah, because they use bacteria at uh, later time points in each of these cases. Right. Oh, okay. Right? So they're using more resistant bacteria in this case. That's oh, that's the bit I was missing I mean, on this. I yeah. mean, even in the past. So like, if we go to go to S four, um, like one slide back. <clears throat> yeah. They're using they're using the fully resistant bacteria here, right? But they're using right. the partially resistant bacteria in 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 the next one. So I, I guess that is clear. That's really clear. I, I would assume that you'd get the same. I mean, I guess maybe you wouldn't get the same results if you use the fully resistant bacteria here. But they well, didn't do that. I mean, I think that I'm, I mean I'm trying to think because I think the they they try to use the fully resistant bacteria, but they don't. But the they the bacteria behaves differently, so. I think also they uh, they think... have they have they, they only have fully resistant bacteria for one of these conditions, right? So they wanted right. to do they wanted to do each of the lineages P1, P2, and P3. Mm. So like they weren't I, I guess they're not able, right? They're not able to go and and do it and show the resistant. I still would have liked to see the resistant version because here like they're leading us down this story where like there might be some fundamental difference between the the phage trained uh the evolution of the phages from the untrained in the tra into the trained but i don't know if that's the case it might just be driven by the fact that they used partially resistant bacteria here but fully resistant bacteria in the previous one yeah i mean i think another factor is that the the fully resistant bacteria were just less less evident so for like i think for p1 all the bacteria were still sensitive at the end of the the trial yes whereas in yeah. in p2 some of them were like still well mostly partially sensitive and only in like the final one were some of them fully resistant and i think you can sort of see that with the traces i mean the traces for that one that i mean you see in like one of the populations in purple it's still fully like a flat line whereas mm -hmm. uh with the others that's a lot rarer to see so because they show every single replicate so there is still one that is uh completely resistant and then yes. yeah so uh, I guess it's partly mm -hmm. the trying to analyze representation of here because, um, yeah, um, yeah, so, yeah. And and then the other interesting thing I find about this uh, this figure is that then they also do plaque assays. That efficiency of plating is essentially a plaque assay. I think. Yes. Um, so, but before they said that they didn't see <laughs> the effects with on solid media but then here they are seeing some effects on the solid media it makes me wonder like i'd like to see the data from when they couldn't find it in the earlier one and what's the difference there why why here and not before yeah i think you you raise a, a really good point there um in the pnas paper they the, it seems like the reviewers made them do the efficiency of plating for everything and then they also made them uh, we'll see. They made them re-derive everything again. <laughs> uh, like, basically repeat their experiments because they only did three replicates. Um, and uh, I feel like there's something missing. Like, that's really helpful in in narrowing down for the claims of the paper what they were trying to show. But from the curiosity standpoint, in terms of the unanswered questions, it would be interesting to see, like, some of those replicates run through the same battery of tests. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I think we'll, we'll talk to, but I think we've got, uh, another big table to yeah, uh, yeah. go through about yeah. the, these are all the phage mutations, uh, uh, dis dis that distinguish, uh, I think this is for like TRNT, uh, sorry, turn, uh, trained and untrained, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is like going way back to the beginning, right? Like mm. you had said previously, these were isolated beforehand that hmm. they were the two versions and so they know all the they sequenced the two i suppose and they knew all the things that were different between the two um and 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 furthermore they also knew that specific mutations in the j gene the the tail fat one of the tail fibers, fibers yeah um that those mutations are responsible for giving the train phage or yeah the train phage the ability to use omp f as a receptor and what was really curious, the observation that sort of connects these pieces of previously known information to our experiment, is that in their co-evolution experiments, when they sequence the phage, uh, they see that there's similar mutations occurring in the J gene, very specifically, um, yeah, there, there are similar mutations that 
occur in the J gene. It's specifically, it's from a recombination event. Um, yeah. Where a chunk of the J gene got recombined into the E. coli strain, uh, and that produced these mutations. <laughs> Yeah, I guess for that we need to explain that. Uh, so we, we talked about earlier how sometimes phages can integrate into the genome and become mm -hmm. in lysogeny. And so some of those phages just never reactivate. They, they mutate and eventually get incorporated into the E. coli genome. And uh -huh. so in this case, one of these phages, which we kind of refer to as extinct phages, recombined with uh, lambda and, in, yeah. and that integrated into it to give it the ability... Well, what we presume is the ability to expand those, but they don't actually know at this point. They just know that it happened. And it happened, next, yeah. And it yeah. has the mutations that are the same. So, like, they're like, okay, well, let's go and find this out for sure. <laughs> yeah, and that's what figure six is about. So, we're uh, again, this kind of is a PNAS version where they show the actual mutations that happened and they use this recombinant uh, lambda TRN. Um, mm -hmm. that, and then they kind of compare that in, uh, with the other strains. Yeah, they just they just made right. They made it. <laughs> yeah, they just instead made of, it. Instead of grabbing the co-evolved version, they're saying, okay, if we think that the reason why right the the trained phage is um, better than has this ability rather than the untrained phage, well, let's just like do let's just make it then, right? Let's make those differences. Do the recombination. Um, yeah. So they make the version that has that section. And then they test it against all these different backgrounds. And in all three cases, they do three different backgrounds. They do wild type, they do uh, no mal T, which is no lamb B, or like very little lamb B. And then they do no mal T and no omp F. So, um, yeah, that's for the bacteria. But the actual phages they use is they got the pre recombination lambda. So there's a previous paper where they took the, the, the same strains and they mapped out their family tree and figured out the point before the recombination. And they mm -hmm. just reconstituted the mutations without that's in like kind of the middle bit and they test that against the one with the recombinant R. So the ideally these should be the same if the if the uh, recombination has no effect then they should be the same. But yes. if they're not then the if the recombination is having an effect then we should see that it improves the relative growth rate of that phage in the And what we're seeing in hosts. B is competition between those two strains, right? So yes. anything above one means that uh, the recombinant strain is doing better. Yeah. And it's the so like with Mal T, that's that should like mean that any so Mal T is related to the Lam B, right? Uh, so mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. should confer resistance to things like the untrained phage, and then Mal T and Ompev. So those are the two uh, receptors that the recombinant uh, train strain should be at having. So in theory, yes. uh, that should should be uh, having an effect. And what's what's happening here is that that it so i mean it's easy to get full because you might be thinking oh it makes it more infectious but actually what we're seeing here is the ratio is going up going up which means that the pre recombination lambda is doing much 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 worse and yes. that's making the recombinant look better because the recombinant is still surviving in spite of this so mm -hmm. there's something that recombination recombinant version is doing that does is independent of multi and on pev theoretically yeah, I find that like that's that's a a little bit that's that's a, a little bit different than what originally instigated them to do this experiment, right? Because what originally instigated them to do it was that they thought the recombination was bringing in the ability to use OMPF, mm. but it seems like it's probably bringing in other stuff as well. <laughs> right. <clears throat> yeah. Um... yeah. So. I think it's it's very interesting from the standpoint of just the story of it. Like, I really love that it's they could track down some uh, increased ability of this phage to um, to infect the E. coli from recombination. That's a really mm. cool thought, and I, they do highlight that in a discussion, right? Where uh, this is a potential mechanism, right, in which phage training brings in the necessary genetic components to make that phage better at infecting their host. Um, but yeah, it, it, the story that the recombination allows you to use omp F is a little muddied in this particular piece of data because uh, it seems like it just makes it better in general. <laughs> right, yeah. So it... <laughs> And it's again, it's hard to predict recombination events because again, that relies on the kind of random effects happen. So if you're trying to train a phage, you can't count on a recombination effect happening like this. This is just a very uh, lucky thing to happen. But I no, mean... but I think that I think that the hope is that because the conditions of 
the coach, the training procedure is just ev is evolution, mm. right? Is evolution against the selection pressure of having to grow in this bacteria that is evolving with you. So I, I'm not saying that I, I think that um, it's more the knowledge that recombination could lead to these beneficial beneficial meaning that more infectious phage um, versus having to wait for point mutations to accumulate mm. might mean that the strains that you're like it matters then the coevolution strain that you're using <laughs> right to train your phage in because it's not just that the phage are undergoing random mutation it's that there could also be dialogue between mm. the phage genome and what you're co-training it in right that's that's the implication and they do talk about this in the discussion that's the implication yeah. Of, of figure six <clears throat> right uh and i think we're going to be going to the pnas exclusive uh figure <laughs> um yeah where i i suspect that it's the reviewers would like to see a more robust sample set uh of trained phage not just the one that was isolated from previous experiments <clears throat> yeah so actually what they did is they didn't so much repeat the experiment they picked up a there was actually an official repetition of that previous experiment called repeatability and contingency and evolution of the a key innovation in phage lambda which is another paper that was uh -huh. published in 2012 and so which was in itself was a repeat so they took the phages from that and then they and gotcha. so during that experiment <laughs> they got a, a lambda which they've dubbed lambda neon pef uh and tested that out in the same way that they did th these lambdas. So independently evol co evolved. Um, yes, 12 independently co evolved. Yeah. Right? So. 12. And six of them have the ability to use on theft, but six of them do not. So they're, they're right. Like, I think this speaks again to that recombination data. Right. There are other ways to get more infectious phage <laughs> than just the acquisition of on theft. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and then they uh, run run that through the, their growth experiments, just like in Figure One that we saw, I think, mm -hmm. yeah, a, a while ago. Um, yeah. So uh, again, they, they. But here it becomes pretty clear that ONTAF is the important factor, though, because right. that's what's looking. There, right? Those are the ones that are um, like the new ONTAF ones. They kind of just look like the untrained phage. <laughs> Uh, they they kind of similar, but there is a lot more variation there. So there there could yeah. be something else going on there, but it's quite hard mm -hmm. to pick apart, and that's not really the the focus of this paper. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, and they but yeah, again, you can see that the new Ompef very much their trace is as chaotic and and decreased as a train phage. So that really yeah. does emphasize the effect of Ompef on this. Mm hmm. Um. So yeah, um, yeah. I mean, that's that's what we got. So I want to. I guess I maybe let's go back to this discussion of like. So the implication the, the what what the paper is trying to give us is this picture of um, how the coevolution process is making the phages, the train phages, better at dealing with uh, the ancestral. Uh, version of the of the bacteria um, and it shows us that um, that the, the the evolved the resistant bacteria they are also changing right there's also a bunch of changes in the bacteria to get resistance but those changes make the bacteria less fit right um, and and so they don't so they they're not like they're um, they're not um, they're not easy to happen, right? Like they happen gradually. They take a long time to happen. Um, and that argues for the efficacy of using these train phages because um, the, they'll force the bacteria down a path that is difficult to go down and they may just kill the bacteria before they can get down that path. <clears throat> right. I mean, I think that the, the, this is good is it shows how phages, this kind of co-evolutionary uh, kind of experiment can throw up kind of uh, an idea of the like kind of ev the kind of space uh, like the kind of evolutionary space that that resistance can appear so mm -hmm. i mean uh, it can show us like the importance of on it can also raise new avenues that we can look at in terms of protecting as phage resistance and how it can be useful to to encode a, a phage that is uh, more kind of um able to attack multiple uh, avenues uh, the thing that it doesn't necessarily convince me of is how this can actually be used to create a therapeutic 
like uh, like for a new oh, bacteria yeah. that because because <laughs> uh, these are both taking samples from coevolutionary experiments from 10 years ago which tells me that these coevolutionary experiments are not are not easy to run it, so, it sounds like they're quite resource intensive which means that uh, they, they're using like a very lab adapted strain but if i'm trying to use a wild strain of bacteria out of nowhere then that could take a lot of work to get there but yeah well i mean i think the the thought is that if phage therapy was something that caught on and was an effective therapy and coevolution that strategy is appropriate to pursue you would have to train the phages for the the patient's individual strain of uh, infectious strain right so like when you get the labs back from your id doctor right those strains would be used to train the, the phage that then ends up treating you it's very um I mean, there's a lot of medicine that's gone down this path, right? But that's mm. the CAR T, um, yeah. when, right? CAR T cells, like that that genetic change they're doing to the cells have to come from some patient material. And in this case, the patient material in, in phage training would be the strain of bacteria that's infecting the patient. Yeah, so for that, I don't think it's necessarily appropriate. But if you were to say, take lots of wild strains and then do these coevolutionary ex experiments, and then you get an idea of, what so you get an idea of the the, the kind of j segments that could uh, attack multiple th then then we have a fa a patient then you say oh i've got lots of options for different phages that occupy different evolutionary niches depending on what mutations come up so i can use a cocktail mix them together and yeah. make a cocktail yeah so <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. so from this one i'd be saying okay we've got this j segment with that with this extinct phage and then we can slap that onto a phage that we know it infects and then we can uh, add that in so it's almost like a way of understanding how the phages work and attack and then then we can pick up information from these evolution experiments and then use recombination to create phages that can be better so not necessarily using coevolutionary sure. phages but using the knowledge gained from these kinds of experiments can be quite useful yes okay yeah i i, I see that application quite clearly in this especially the way that they set up uh, figure six, right? Yeah. It's very much like, like, oh, we found from the evolution experiment, we found things that could be beneficial for this phage to infect things. Now we engineered a phage <laughs> to have those elements, and then this phage will be better at than than non-engineered phages. <laughs> yeah, and I'm thinking like, well, lots of bacteria have extinct phages in their genome. So if you took took sequences of all those extinct phages and then tested them out to see whether they like put them on a lytic backbone and then test them to see whether they would work or not i mean that's the kind of sure interesting thoughts that kind of generated it for me that there i mean and even you so well, i think that this is we, kind of yeah we've talked about we've talked about antibiotic discovery right, right. That process and in some ways what we're seeing here is also a type of discovery right it's a discovery of diversity in phages that correlate to increased ability to kill bacteria um so yeah i don't know maybe the future of phage therapy looks like that some sort of program like that right like discuss like doing uh these unlikely combinations of phage uh right like phages you know, co-evolve with different strains learning about like what they're getting from those different strain and those different replications and then creating like yeah, these cocktails of phages made from these different co-evolutionary experiments yeah mm -hmm. i mean it's it it's interesting because the way phages work is that they they do replicate so actual dosing of phages is one of those things that isn't necessarily as important but what happens if you have a non-replicating phage that just delivers a lethal dose of something i mean how mm -hmm. would that work as a treatment because then you wouldn't necessarily have to worry about the mutation so so much because everything's a lot more controlled uh well mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. something you don't mm -hmm. you wouldn't worry about reproducibility because it would still be built into that the problem is it would be less good maybe um so there's a lot of in so phages are an interesting technology and i feel like they're quite in the early stages they're quite complex and that's the thing that's holding them back um so we got a comment from minimal like in the middle of this but it's kind of not totally related to what we know it's, not, it's related to phage um they're asking about uh like what oh. are the implications of quorum sensing systems being discovered in phages actually i, I right? can speak about something because i do know that there has been this talk well I saw a talk a couple of years ago uh, about this one idea of having phages that uh, can use a core sensing, sensing system to to stop uh, to communicate with bacteria to stop them producing virulence factors. So yes. the yeah, because often virulence factors are under the control of quorum sensing. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, there was this idea that 
uh, instead of, say, trying to destroy all bacteria, trying to use quorum split sensing to communicate with them, to make them into less infectious, uh, so to make it, depending on the situation where they're less infectious, or even using phages to to kind of select for ones that are less infectious, to make the virulent ones be outcompeted by the ones that are less infectious. So almost turning them into good bacteria. <laughs> so Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the discovery of, of quorum sensing systems on phages, to me, the implication to me is this question, oh, the phages are talking to bacteria, not each other. <laughs> oh, phages talking to each other. No, Ooh. I don't. I, is that true? I don't <laughs> know. Oh, no, I'm not no, talking about... I don't... I'm talking about, like... I'm not... Sorry. Uh... Yeah, I, I guess we'll have to follow up on that. He left us this comment, Arbit Arbitrium and Rap Phi... Phi... Yeah, Phi Rap. Yeah, we'll 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 look it up. I I yeah so, I don't know about that. Communicating That's, with I have not heard so of I all. yeah because I know like there are lots of virulence factors that come on phages. Um, but whether the phages use them themselves for something for some purpose, I can understand ooh. bringing them in if it makes the bacteria a different type of environment so, for themselves. So I looked up Arbitrium. It is a viral peptide. Pre so according to Wikipedia, it's a viral peptide produces by bacteria phages to allow them to communicate with each other. So it hmm. basically uh, signals to other phages that hope. So this is interesting. But that means the phage, the phage will have to have the receptor for that, right? And if it has the receptor for that, it only communicates to the lysogens some, in some way. Or maybe it communicates through a bacterial receptor on, on something. Anyways, this is like so, a little bit... Yeah, I'm this not is, sure how this relates to phage yeah, therapy. <laughs> I, I, I found out about it literally because of Winamimal's comments. So it will take me some time to, to delve into the details of this. But, I mean, it is but interesting. No, but, yeah. Yeah, no, that is fascinating. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, thank I you love very that idea. Yeah. Like, phages have, for me, when I think about phages, I've always thought of them as a force of moving genes around like that's like their ultimate like um one of their ecological functions is like moving genes around yeah to think of them also as communicating with each other in some ways the yeah, i mean the implications are very different in like my way of thinking about ev of ecology uh, but you know everyone also has their own idea of what that is and like i'm not an, <laughs> an ecologist so like it's also just these are just my own like thoughts about yeah um how i think everything well i mean it's something <laughs> interesting because like we get taught about phages as almost selfish gene rep uh, elements where they mm -hmm. so they can occur in the genome without even ever kind of going out of the genome they can just spread yeah. within it or so yeah. it's interesting to so we just tend to underestimate viruses generally because i know that yeah giant, yeah I Sorry, but then I but then I end up thinking of like because we know about lysogeny, I I, I end up thinking about phages as like just another class of transposon, <laughs> right? Like they're just they're a mobile genetic element, and they can also be selected for by um by the selective pressures of a particular organism, right? So like some phages, yeah, they're selfish, but some phages have become like uh, obligately, right? They're obligate parasites. They may become obligate symbiotes at some point. But yeah, no, this is arbitrary is quite interesting because it, because I'm now I'm just I've read the Wikipedia sucked now. Out. I've got sucked in and I'm I'm like because <laughs> actually it, it's quite important about because we talk about the lysis and lysogeny and our, the idea that like is that phages when there aren't many hosts around they can produce like a compound that will signal to other phages to go into lysogeny rather than lysis. Um, yeah. So that. Yeah. Well, you know what? That that this is something where we can find papers for next week. Yeah, we can definitely find <laughs> right? and put yeah. it into our docket. Yeah, that so, we might be able to say something more about it. Yeah, I mean, I guess it'd be interesting <sighs> from the terms of phage therapy because that would be something that phage therapy does not want because they don't want lysogeny to happen. So right. The, so right. otherwise, because lysogeny means that the bacteria will become resistant to that phage just because of the way it works. So, mm -hmm. so essentially, it means yeah, the that... phage will decide that they don't want to lice this bacteria anymore. Yeah, <laughs> they so... just want to live it. They just want to live in it. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean that. I mean, they, in this particular experiment, they did select phages for the whole purpose point that they they don't cause lysogeny. They wanted to have lytic phages specifically. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. That means that the yeah that was at the very beginning embedded in this when they chose their lambda strain it was not able to cause lysogeny, right? So it probably was missing some integrases and stuff like that.
So yeah, I mean, thank you so much, Minimal, for for letting us know about that. That's <laughs> I, no, that's a yeah. very interesting lead, and I I, well, I do want to read more about it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, join us next week for a deep dive week or for a news week where we're gonna survey papers to find something to cover in more detail the following week, probably including something about this arbitrium, um, yeah, or at least uh, something related to phage again. <laughs> Yeah, and we want to remind everyone that while we're very enthusiastic about microbiology and somewhat qualified, it's possible we didn't get everything right. So science is about thinking critically and asking the right questions. So if you have any questions or corrections, please let us know in the comments. I totally agree. Uh, you can reach out to us over Twitter or the hashtag microTWJC. We both believe, or, or I guess the comments too, right, as we as we do these live yeah. streams. Um, we both believe that peer review is a process and that we can all participate in it. So we hope that you've had a good time listening to this ramble about microbiology today. And if you think you've found something uh, wrong or unclear, let us know. Yeah, it's been a pleasure chatting with you, Danny. Same here, Foz. So tune in next week for more microbiology content. Bye. Oh, sorry, Honman. I need to...